Let's look at different Native American societies and the diversity that existed before European contact. We'll start down in that green region in what's known as the Southwest. When we think of Southwestern American uh, Native Americans, think these are the ones that are most similar to the Mexican societies and empires south of the border that we read about. In terms of food source, they're growing maize, they're growing corn. In fact, they even um, created multiple varieties of corn, white corn, yellow corn, red corn, and also even a black and white corn. And they're able to grow this much corn in this arid climate using a very sophisticated irrigation system. And because they're producing so much food, they're able to have permanent settlements. A lot of times we think of Native American societies as primitive and not as advanced. But as a result of the abundance of food, it allows for significant economic development. It allows for specialization. It allows other people in this society to focus on art or military prowess or religion. It also allows other objects in addition to things to eat to be produced. It also allows for more sophisticated um, and more developed uh, housing to grow like these pueblos we see here. And as a result of this economic development, we get significant social stratification. We have high-ranking chiefs. We have priests that are important in this society. We also have administrators um, managing that food supply. And that irrigation system requires management as well. So sometimes we think of Native American societies as much more primitive than Europe at this time. But in areas like the American Southwest, that's not the case. When you think of the Pueblo Indians in the Southwest, don't think of the Tuscan Raiders and Jawas from Star Wars. This is a sophisticated, advanced society with permanent structures and complex irrigation producing massive amounts of food. Next, let's move to that orange area right in the middle, the area we know as the Great Plains. On the Great Plains, we have two main language groups, the Algonquin and the Siouan. And both groups on the Great Plains are what we would call nomadic, meaning they moved around, oftentimes following their food source, which was mainly bison. And they hunted those bison, like we see here. Um, they often cooked over a buffalo hide that was held over a fire and shook uh, or maybe just had hot rocks added to it so that the hide wouldn't burn. This is a way to improvise a cooking implement when you need to remain nomadic. Carrying large pots uh, is not very easy if you're trying to remain nomadic. Um, these nomadic tribes used what was called a travoice to move goods from place to place, including their teepees, their homes. And before they had the horse, they used dogs to move their goods and materials. However, despite the fact that they're nomadic, there are some tribes on the Great Plains who maybe seasonally or maybe permanently grew corn around the river valleys found on the Great Plains. These are not just savages rolling across an arid wasteland. These are also a complex society um, that happens to be nomadic. Let's look next at that yellow area around us, what's known as the Eastern Woodlands. In the Eastern Woodlands, you have probably the most diverse diet of any Native Americans. You have some societies developing both a mixture of agriculture and hunter-gatherer economies, and there's really enough food and game, as well as the opportunity to grow food, that we see the development of permanent villages. Many tribes in the Algonquin language group in this region, and that would be all this pink area there, um, were probably more focused on the hunter-gatherer uh, aspect of their diet. Uh, along the coast, they used fishing to gain valuable protein, and 
those Algonquin tribes that were more inland hunted uh, animals like bear and deer. They often lived in structures like the one we see back there behind us, known as wigwams. And their villages ranged from 500 to about 2,000 people. And they were often, in the Algonquin uh, language group, many of those tribes were often patriarchal, meaning men held the dominant positions of power and wealth and prestige passed down through the father's lineage in the family. In the eastern woodlands, we also have what were called the Iroquois, and they were a different language group than the Algonquin. Um, they've practiced more farming, although still some hunting and gathering, and they lived in what were called longhouses. And in these longhouses, you would have not just one family, but an entire interconnected family and band living together. One big difference between the Iroquois and the Algonquin were that they were matriarchal, uh, as men were often gone on long hunting trips or trading, which was very important to the Iroquois. Uh, women's roles were drastically increased in Iroquois tribes, and they held important positions uh, in tribal decision-making. In addition to living in longhouses, they also built walls around their villages. And as you can see, it looks a lot like maybe a, a early European settlement with those walls. What these walls tell you is that this is a permanent village. They are not moving somewhere else. They are here year round and they are producing enough food that they don't have to move when um, game or fish move to other areas. It also tells us that there was conflict and, um, and battle over these resources, over this land, over this hunting area. And as a result, they chose to defend themselves. The last area we'll look at is that green area up stretching from Alaska down to Northern California, which uh, historians often refer to as the Northwest Coast region or the Pacific Northwest. In the Pacific Northwest, you have one of the most populous regions in North America before 1492. There is an abundance of resources and, as a result, an abundance of Native American people living in this area. They, they uh, fished for some of their uh, food source. They also, practiced, they also hunted seals and whales. And um, this very rich uh, region produced very stratified cultures. If you think of the symbol that goes with this region, the totem pole that we see here, the totem pole is symbolic for many of the societies in the Pacific Northwest. It's stratified. There's groups on the top, there's groups in the middle, and there are groups on the bottom. They also built very large seagoing canoes to help with that sealing and whaling. Uh, these are major um, naval vessels that they are using on the Pacific Ocean, and it's Native Americans in this tribe that are gonna encounter Europeans much, much later than, say, Native Americans in Central Mexico or other regions of North America.